get started with the show, we wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there. It helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. Thanks to our latest donor, Amanda Craig. Amanda is a novelist and former guest of Always Take Notes. Her latest novel, The Golden Rule, has been long listed for the Women's Prize. So thank you very much for your support, Amanda. If you pledge $10 a month, you get a free two-month trial to Otter worth $26 alongside the other rewards. Otter offers automated transcription and live note-taking for in-person and virtual meetings. I found it to be a huge help when organising interview material. You also get access to a series of mini-episodes from previous guests on the show in which they answer three revealing questions. The next episode is with James Ashton, and here's a snippet. And I think the learnings for me are, like the Scouts, be prepared, read in carefully for a piece, work the angles, and I think in an interview situation, know who you're going to meet, know what you want to get out of that meeting, and don't rely on anyone else to ask the question you want the answer to. And I think more broadly, have confidence in your ability. Hello, and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, we speak to journalist and novelist Leif Arbuthnot. We spoke to Leif about her novel, Looking for Eliza, about breaking into journalism and about working at Tatler. It's a great episode. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Leif, to Always Take Notes. It's great to have you on the show. I wondered if we could start by talking about loneliness, which is a theme that's sort of popped up in your work and in your novel, Looking for Eliza, but also in an essay that you wrote for London Magazine, which you sent over to us. What appeals to you about loneliness and and how do you go about writing about it <laughs> I think um, appeals is like a strong way of putting it I'd say that um, it's kind of making the best of a, of a bad situation um, I, I like the idea and I think it's been proven by lots of um, writers and artists um, through the ages really that loneliness can produce um, you know great work and um, that it's a sort of essential part of um, being a fairly um, sentient person um, so I, I'm interested in almost trying to, you know, recoup or, you know, the sort of Baudelairean idea of, of getting the flower on top of the heap of dung, you know. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I look, I try and look at loneliness sometimes um, just as, you know, personally, not necessarily even as a writer, but as um, something out of which, you know, good can come. Um, because I feel like it's something that's, um, you know, accompanied me at various phases of my life. And, um, you know, it's the same with other people um so I, i'm interested in the kind of generative capacities of loneliness as a, as a writer but um also i think seeing it in in that way is actually quite therapeutic and and, and personally quite um you know encouraging could we roll back now to your early interest in writing and in particular to the emails that you wrote to yourself when you were 11 which i really loved as a as a detail in that essay um, just tell us, you know, tell us a bit about that. For we'll, we'll put the piece in the show notes, but also about, you know, your your route to, to getting involved in this. I also saw another interview you said, um, I think it was with the the language faculty at Cambridge, where where you were saying that you didn't always think of yourself as wanting to be a writer from an early age. So perhaps, you know, those those two elements. Uh, I'm so, so on on the writing emails to myself front. Um, when I was a uh, a kind of schoolgirl, um, I we, the the email was just becoming quite a big deal, and um, and I I got into a lengthy correspondence with myself um, because I would send myself emails one in, in the morning or an email, and then I'd pick up the email later when I went back into the school computer room and I'd reply. Um, with great spirit and kind of surprise at the email that had landed in in, in my <laughs> inbox, <laughs> and um, and I think that 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 I mean that it's it's funny to see that in connection with writing. I, I mean, I suppose it's it's obvious, but um, it wasn't ob- It hasn't been obvious to me until maybe actually you, you kind of ask the question that there is a link between me emailing myself probably and me ending up as a writer because you know, writing is, it does involve kind of constant, yeah, like dialogue with yourself. And, and I also read aloud as I write, and I'm quite an active writer in that sense that um, I feel like there are different parts of me that I'm kind of trying to bring into, you know, bring into conversation when I'm writing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I did that because I found it funny. 
Um, and also because um, it was no one else was emailing me and I wanted to get emails. And um, I'm sure there's lots of other stuff at work there. But um, yeah, it was it was certainly uh, like a, a fun thing that I started doing. And then people started taking the piss and it all snowballed and then end, ended up, you know, there being a big pile of these emails in my friend's flat. Um, and then as for the as for the kind of writer um, question, you know, me, my sort of path into it and. I didn't I, I didn't know any writers when I was growing up. Um, that's not to say that I wasn't like really like, you know, in a very happy and like privileged home. But I didn't you know, we didn't know any journalists or any authors or anything. So I don't think in that sense, it really occurred to me. Um, but I just read all the time from when I was pretty young. I remember like my yeah, going um, I, I kind of went to school quite early because my my older sister was going to school and I just like went into the school and sort of sat down and refused to move so so got reading quite early um and then as as I got older maybe from like late school time to through university I then I kind of was writing and doing you know journalism and stuff like that and um just it seemed to me the most appealing way to spend my time um and that hasn't changed so it's it's been I I don't see I mean I, I guess I technically am a writer and you know I think it's a bit um coy to sort of shut like pull away from that label because what people see me as you know amongst other things um but there hasn't been some crashing realization or some calling to the craft you know um some people want to be a doctor forever and I wanted to be you know a bunch of things but writer wasn't one of them could you tell us a little bit about your uh, student journalism because you were writing for the tab when it was really in its in its earliest days weren't you and what was that like yeah, um, well, it was, it, I, I kind of got into it from, again, I suppose, you know, a social, a desire to find my place socially. Um, I knew that I, I, I did, I did modern languages at, at Cambridge um, University and I started in, in 2010. Um, and I felt like I was just going from like my, the faculty to my room. And at the time I wasn't drinking and I was quite socially um, awkward and removed. I felt quite like alienated from the sort of student situation which I'm looking back I regret and I wish I'd been less of an arsehole and less kind of like you know of a misanthrope but I'm um, certainly I was <laughs> was then um and so I, I I felt like I needed to expand my social circle and try and find like more people that I could hang out with and potentially make friends with so um I I kind of started writing for the Varsity which is the the kind of up, very smart Cambridge newspaper and also the tab which was um this internet uh like newspaper website thing in its infancy it then became quite a big deal and kind of got you know they're a little they're outposts at all the all the little all the universities across the UK and they tried to you know integrate into America too with not very much success um and and I think I mean I I I, end, I loved writing for the tab because online there's no kind of limit on what you can you know put out so and they were they were real that everyone working there was really fun and they they kind of were up for you know, me doing whatever I felt like. So one of my my kind of major things that, like, you know, I, I sort of was my idea to do was um, called Leafs Lunches, where I reviewed all the um, the canteen food at the different Cambridge colleges, which was actually quite a good idea looking back because that it was kind of a, a topic of heated debate at Cambridge, like who has the best food, and there I went. So I just went around to all the different colleges eating there. Um, so that yeah I felt very free um writing for the tab because they, they didn't really stop me from doing anything I just kind of wrote what I wanted and they'd upload it and then on we went and I'm you know obviously looking back I'm horrified by what I wrote I think it's really like it's trying so hard to be funny and it's often really not funny so, <laughs> um so I'm embarrassed about it and once I had an intern um who, who like read read out started reading out one of my articles when he was um on the desk where I was working and it was like you know torture but um but it, it certainly got me on my way so I, I don't regret it what was the relationship at that time between the, the sort of established student press between varsity and the tab did they okay given that you were kind of walking the line between them did they regard you as a turn code <laughs> yeah well uh, the, there was some rivalry and you weren't it's funny looking back so it makes it sound like the wild west but um or so you know some mafioso kind of different groups but um I, I wasn't I was told that I had to choose between varsity and the tab you couldn't write for both so um I chose the tab because everyone at varsity seemed to be so stuck up and quite like 
oh, we are, we are, you know, the young times leader writers of tomorrow and, you know, very kind of full on serious people. And uh, that wasn't, that wasn't really what I wanted. I wanted to have, you know, like be a bit more impish, I guess. Um, so I went for the tab and, um, there, and I, I, I don't know, I think sometimes, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a house of not really, not major newspaper readers, but we'd probably get like a paper at the weekend. Um, so, that even in even in me there was a sense that like oh internet journalism isn't really that good like I should be in the broadsheet you know if it's just the Cambridge broadsheet um but I it, it it made sense for me to kind of stick with the tab because it had more more to offer for me as a writer you mentioned reading some of them back and sort of cringing I guess at the attempts to be funny but how helpful was it in those sort of early years to develop your voice to have you know, not a particularly strong editorial voice, but it was just you were allowed to express yourself however you pleased. Yeah, I think it was, um, I think it was really helpful. Um, it was also, it kind of toughened me up a bit because um, I got really like, um, I got loads of like trolling, well, not loads, but quite a, an amount, you know, in the comments. Was this for the lunch piece? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes people would be like, <laughs> you know, what the you know, what the fuck is she fucking talking about? <laughs> and and actually, yeah, once my friend Peter was telling me the other day, and I've got an amazing capacity to forget things that 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 are, you know, like quite central. Like I'm I'm very forgetful, like really in a big way. And he was telling me that once I got an email, I got a Facebook message from someone who'd who sent me my own article by mistake and said with a message saying like um, I can't believe she's doing this or something, something really rude. And, um, and apparently I walked over to him in the library and like was laughing about it, but I've forgotten this entirely. But anyway, so, so I think there was, it, it felt like a lot of people were reading the pieces and, and I felt quite visible, which was, you know, bad for my ego in the sense that I felt like I became uh, sort of, I felt like more important than I, than I had before. A big name on campus. So. Yeah, well, except not. Again, the... Kind of the voice of your generation. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I would say so. Um, and so, but also, you know, got a lot of like um, pushback and kind of like basic hate, you know, not, 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 no, a lot is a strong way of putting it. But um, I think it's, that's been helpful because, you know, it, I've been trolled since as a, as in my capacity as a journalist, not in a major way, but I, I've written one or two things that have really pissed people off and um you know uh, I learned quite early on to treat those the people who kind of start hating you online as kind of like sad people you know who, do, who aren't really worth listening to um although of course that, that for every person there comes a point where and hopefully I won't meet it where like you know you, the abuse can get just impossible and you know there's definitely a line and of that cohort of people you were doing student journalism with, how many went on to become journalists or writers? Um, not that many, um, but that's not not because they necessarily wanted to. Um, so, you know, some of them went, Ben Dalton, who's a great friend of mine, he, he he's an academic. Harry Shookman, who I, um, he's he's a journalist um, and, and has, you know, worked uh, briefly with me at the Times when I was at the Times. Um, then one of them works at, at Will, um, works at, Facebook, you know, they're, they're, so they've kind of gone on to do things that are that are recognisably that have some root in, in kind of words and things or, you know, barristers. Um, Ellie Pithers, um, I think she was she worked at the tab. She was um, she, she she had a well worked at Vogue for ages. Um, so there have been some, you know, people who've gone on from um, from student journalism to and Laura Prendergast, who worked at Varsity, for instance, she's at, she's at The Spectator. And I, I know her from, you know, I've worked at The Spectator a bit as well. Um, so there have been some, but like not, um, it's not like a kind of, there's not a cabal of like tab people um, in on Fleet Street um, as, yeah, that would be quite fun. But um, yeah, it's relatively, I think maybe people just, you know, decide that um, journalism, yeah, it, it's fun as a sort of undergraduate activity, but maybe actually pursuing it afterwards isn't, isn't like the right idea, which is fair enough. And while you were a student, you were uh, interning at various newspapers and magazines. Why was that... Um an approach you wanted to take and what did you learn while you were doing that? Mm. Um, I, I think I, I had this really, really major fear when I was at university that I wouldn't have a, a job after after leaving. I don't really know why because I think maybe because I didn't have, as I've discussed, like that calling or I didn't want to become a lawyer, I didn't want to become a teacher. I knew I wouldn't be good at like the vast majority of things that I tried. I did do some waitressing and I was really bad at waitressing. So I, I knew that like fairly manual work or, or kind of service work would not work because I was too useless at it. So I, I had this fear that I would just be, you know, 
uh, yeah, just cast out of university and not have anything, you know, not have any income and blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, so then, and then I became kind of, I think I worked through that sort of fear by just getting work experience and like doing internships and, you know, I wasn't paid for them. Um, but once I'd got one placement by like emailing about 30 journalists, um, and one of them said, yes, um, Rose Prince, who was then at the Telegraph, um, I then got more and more and more. And it was actually really helpful because it sort of narrowed it down as to like, you know, I realised I didn't really want to work in magazines, which is ironic because I'm now working at a magazine. But um, I kind of got I got a, the temperature of like various, you know, different newspapers and magazines and things and worked out a bit like what I didn't want to do. And also that um, I, I actually liked, you know, newspapers and, and did want to, you know, did want to see myself working for them. I remember like looking at people sitting at their desks when I was at like, you know, the Telegraph or the Week and, and thinking... They have no idea how lucky they are, these people. They are being paid to do this work. Like, they, they, I just want to go up and shake them and scream into their face, like, how, how lucky are you? Uh, and, then, and then, you know, uh, eventually, like, I built up a decent enough CV to be able to get, like, some a very basic entry-level job, which was... Um, so it was all quite helpful that, that even if it was fueled by slightly insane fear, you know, that didn't really... That was out of proportion to the risk that I was facing. And was all of it unpaid? Did any of those places you were interning... Did they pay you? Uh, I don't remember ever getting paid for anything that I did. Um, I I think I might have had some one one or two lunchtime allowances, like you know, okay. his five quid for some lunch. Um, and it, and my parents had moved out of London, so I was like, you know, sleeping at my uncle's house and you know trying to make it work. And I was uh, lucky because I sort of grew up in London, so I did have a few contacts to be able to like. I stayed at my grandma's for ages. I did have like family and friends in London. I think it's much harder if you. If you don't, even if you don't have a house in London, but if you haven't grown up in London, that's harder to kind of pull off. And I think the attitude has changed a lot to internships since I interned, but not necessarily for the better. Because um, if you, if you're, if organisations are having to pay interns, then often organisations stop taking interns on, and that's a real problem. So it's a really complicated question, and I think you know that it's it's good to have like official you know routes in um but i'm not sure that those routes in actually bring that many people in whereas internships like you know uh, uh, when i was coming up they um they there was there were so many young people in all these newsrooms because of these internships so did you feel you were getting given like real stuff to do because i suppose my my feeling on the payment thing i suppose would be distinct to yours and i feel there's a kind of fairness thing to it but my, my feeling is also that if an organization is paying someone they're much more likely to give them real things to do to like invest in them and, and mentor them and I certainly I had an experience or a number of experiences at university of doing internships or work experience where you ended up just being kind of abandoned and you know not really having anything to do and it was I mean I'm sure some of that was was my lack of initiative as well but did you feel though that you were you getting stuff in the paper and things when you were doing those those gigs no not really um I remember like uh, I got one or two things in the paper. I did a long internship in New York and, well, long, it was like five weeks or something. And I did get a, a kind of feature in, in, in that. It was a food magazine. Um, so that was a great triumph. Um, and I think I got something on the Guardian website that wasn't byline, that was just about like purple being the kind of the colour uh, when I was working on the fashion desk, which was grim because I, I really realised I didn't want to work in fashion journalism at all when I was there. Um, so, yeah, I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't doing proper work at all and I was being treated often pretty like sort of dismissively um but uh, not always but sometimes um but I still think for me the advantage was just soaking up the atmosphere and working out how how the papers and the publications were put together um and so and, and deciding wh where what kind of place I would suit um even if that felt wishful as well because as I said I, I was like agog at the idea of these people actually going to work at these places <laughs> but um I, yeah I found it useful in that sense but um yeah it's obviously really unfair that uh, I also actually don't think that I provided that useful work you know I, I can see that if you're doing like a two-week placement often these things were quite short like they weren't like three-month things um then you know once you it's, it takes half a day to like teach someone how to log in and like show them where the printer is and you know the scanner like how you work the scanner like it's all it was all quite basic stuff but um I don't necessarily I think maybe you're right that like paying the play organizations by paying people have more of an incentive to bring them up but I think it's actually only when you take people on for a like sensible amount of time that you actually invest in them 
Could you tell us about uh, the segue or the journey um, to your first job at the Sunday Times? Yeah, um, I, I was working um, as an intern at the Financial Times um, where uh, I was working on the kind of interactive podcast desk because I was obsessed with podcasts and have been um, for years and years and years. Um, and uh, and then I uh, there was a journalist there who's now at the New York Times called Elizabeth Payton, um, who... Um, I, I don't know, asked for out for a coffee or something. And then, and then she, she had kind of been keeping an eye on me a little bit. Um, and she suggested that I apply for this job at the Sunday Times. Um, and then I went for various drinks with the Sunday Times kind of desk, which was News Review, the, the features desk on the paper. Um, then being headed up by um, a kind of mentor, now mentor of mine and friend, Graham Patterson, who's um, kind of in his mid-60s and is kind of real character, real Fleet Street sort of legend. And also Josh Glancy, who's now the Washington correspondent at the Sunday Times. So they were kind of instrumental in, in bringing me onto the Sunday Times. Um, and I had, I was paid something like absurd, like maybe 17 grand. It was like terribly bad pay. I was really, really broke. Um, but uh, they, it was really, it was worth it because uh, they, they, you know, it's kind of both of them were happy for me to start writing, you know, once I'd shown that I could like do transcripts and, um, you know, uh, kind of fix interviews, um, all of that. Um, fix interviews means basically just getting the interviews. You know, trying to chase people um, and get them to talk to the paper. So yeah, it was it was a it was a kind of fortunate, really a lucky thing, and and it sucks because, you know, that it's a shame that luck has to play such a big role in people's like roots into their careers. But um, with with journalism, I think it's um, pretty common. I was looking through your Sunday Times clips with with fascination, and it's um it's a hugely kind of varied spectrum of stuff you were writing from reviews to features. But I saw actually in one of the reviews to your novels, it characterised you as a writer who spent time explaining millennial culture to middle aged readers of broadsheets. Would that be fair? Do you think, or is that a, a, a glib? I think it is pretty glib. Um, uh, I I mean I. I find that, I mean, I did do one or two things about like, you know, oh, this, the, these are the Kardashians, this is your guide to the Kardashians. But even, I mean, that was a, a hellish piece because I had never in, engaged the Kardashians at all. It's like a classic case of being a sort of boomer millennial, like, you know, you're also no idea who these people are. So um, I, I think, I mean, I did a lot of interviews. I did a lot of book reviews. I, li- I like doing book reviews a lot. And um uh, I mean, my favourite, the the work that I really most enjoyed when, when I was at the Sunday Times was going off and meeting, you know, people who weren't, I mean, I did some celebrity interviews that didn't hugely, you know, interest me, but, you know, they get a lot of space because they're famous people. But I, the, the the stuff I liked most was like going to interview, uh, yeah, famously, my most, my most abject piece perhaps was um, Perro the dog who I interviewed in Wales. I took a five hour train to meet Perro because he'd run home after from like, he, like he'd done some amazing feat of kind of, I think he tra- he travelled 300 miles to get home after he'd been separated from his parents, his human parents, I should say. I, I, you know, I went to chess tournaments. I did all sorts of random stuff. And that was, uh, you know, went around a field with Prince Charles um, and, yeah, just met lots of um, kind of interesting people. So, so I think it, that was a bit of a misreading of my... Sunday Times oeuvre, but um, I'm happy to... My, my apologies. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, the reviewer, the reviewer. Like, I think that's, that your question was completely legit. Um, you know, it, it's understandable if you, if you just look at... That's often what young people, you know, the role that young people play in, in, um, in newspapers. So I can see how that person might have thought that I did that, but it wasn't quite true. When you're writing book reviews, I mean, as someone who also writes a lot of book reviews, um, what's your kind of approach? Um, my feeling is that or I've been told that you have to try and make it entertaining as, you know, a, a standalone piece of journalism that most people are not going to go and buy the book. So, you know, there's no point making vague illusions or, you know, trying to make it cleverer than it is. It has to just be itself. It has to be its own thing. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, and, and now I'm doing sort of film reviews and I think it's a similar thing and um, that... Uh, I mean, it, it, you do get a lot of um, sort of people who, who get annoyed by, for instance, the London Review of Books, uh, which I'm um, which I'm reading uh, now, actually, where they just, you know, that you don't really get a, a, a kind of value judgment sometimes on the book. I mean, I think that's slightly unfair. But um, I mean, I see I see actually as well as kind of raiding the book for interesting stuff and it's nonfiction. I think that's a basic duty of a of a reviewer and maybe it's unfair I think sometimes with the reviews where they basically take scrape it they take all the good stuff and then they just you know you know put it on the 700 words or something then the person is maybe less inclined to buy the book I think that's a pity 
Um, but I, I, as well as kind of doing all that sort of, you know, uh, sort of highlighting all the interesting stuff in the book, if it's nonfiction and maybe if it's fiction, though, it's more complicated than fiction. I think it's an important task for the for the reviewer to um, either, you know, nudge the reader of the review into buying the book or not. You know, you, I think it's, you, you should probably, um, ex, you know, say as, not maybe as crudely as this, but like, is this is this a good read? <laughs> because um, I really appreciate that. And um in in the in the reviews that I read, um, and I think it's an important thing. Also, like I'm I'm I always have quite like sort of characters I'm thinking of when I'm when I'm reading a book for review, including like my mum, who was very you know who says that Zadie Smith is fancy pants and like she doesn't understand you know she's a bit she's quite like she's a, she's very sophisticated and intelligent, but she's fairly she doesn't like uh, have much patience for sort of pyrotechnics. So there are certain people that I try and think about like how would they would they enjoy this book. Um, and I also try and judge a book within its context, you know, as much as I can. Like, I'm not going to apply kind of stringent literary standards to a crime novel. Um, but, um, you know, I should be thinking about it in the context of other crime novels. What was your decision to go freelance then after doing this kind of prolific, prolific portfolio at the same time? Yeah, well, so I was working on the on the leader's desk um, at the Times. So the, the Times every day has the comment section um, and it's also got... Um, the three pieces every day that kind of carry forth the, the paper's view on the big subjects of the day. So it might be, you know, on Sarah Everard or, um, or I don't know, client, the COP26 or whatever. Um, and they're all anonymous and they're written by the kind of comment team. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it was a really, really difficult job um, doing that because you have to, uh, you, you kind of get your subject at about 12, 12, 15 after talking with the editor um, and the other leader writers who are columnists, really. Um, and then you have to go and, you know, research um, as much as you can and then co- turn the copy round for f- for about sort of quarter to five, five. Um, and I, I found that I, it, it was definitely the wrong part of the paper for me because I think I, as a journalist, not necessarily as a writer, but like I'm interested in, in light, I, I quite like, being funny and and more kind of stories about people rather than about the kind of the big um you know talking points of the day um you know I'd write about like I remember having like really dreading having to write about um I think it was like the Middle East just like broadly the Middle East as like a taking the temperature and I felt wildly underqualified to to sort of in within four hours turn around the Times's official view on the Middle East. Um, so I was I was kind of really unhappy doing that. Um, and so, you know, and, and I, I feel like, you know, in journalism, you're not paid very well. And if you're not happy doing what you're doing, it's maybe a good idea to stop what you're doing and do something else. And, and you know, as a freelancer, it was quite d- difficult because, I mean, I started off, pretty well like I I kind of started doing lots of things and then uh, but mostly about the arts which is what I'm really interested in writing about um and also interviews Uh, and then it became a bit difficult because the pandemic happened and the arts became like really crunched you know down so it was it was sort of good luck bad luck and that I didn't regret kind of you know being freelance and it was really liberating to just like try and sell my wares at different papers but um the the yeah, the pandemic changed the, the the kind of landscape for freelancers in quite a major way and um yeah that was quite like I, I hadn't realized how much my work relied on other people doing their work you know putting out plays or starting new you know tv like i don't know whatever it was all that art scene that was um bubbling away and supporting me while you were uh, freelance how did it all fit together did you have a sort of regular column somewhere or was it mostly just sort of juggling lots of balls at lots of different um circuses so to speak <laughs> yeah um well it was yeah it was mostly um what like a horrible metaphor sorry <laughs> no 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 <laughs> I mean I'm not a good juggler but um but yeah I, I kind of got a, a couple of regular things like I did um I'm still doing actually mail on Sunday uh podcast reviews and um I started doing book reviews for the mail as well and then would and then you know picked up stuff for like the Guardian and the Telegraph and just kind of did what I could and Typically, it'd be like, you know, feast to famine, you'd get I'd get like a big commission and then have to like really work on it for sort of 48 hours straight. And then and then I'd I'd go like a week where I didn't have any good ideas and I didn't really have any, you know, anything to write about. So um, that it was quite a disconcerting kind of, you know, like seesaw. Um, but I think the key I mean, from what I hear, I mean, I'm, I'm not currently freelance, but 
I think that the key is to have some like regular slots that like bring in a bare minimum of money so that you can so that the, the kind of the, the pitch that you're sending out to an editor doesn't like your your rent doesn't depend on that you know um on that kind of landing I think that that's really stressful for people and I wouldn't do it I wouldn't be freelance if I like had kids or had any serious responsibilities which I don't Thanks for being kind of candid about that. As you know, we always ask about money and writing and stuff. And, and sort of before COVID inverted the world, were you were you able to to make a living out of it? Was it was it worth? Um, was I'd it say working? I'd say yes, just but like only because. So I've been working at the Spectator, and I was doing a couple of days a week um, for them, and that was really really helpful because both it it provided me with a kind of office scenario, which was really helpful. Um, and it also just, um, well, I, I mean, I, 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 yeah, it brought in regular money. But I think if I'd not been doing a couple of days a week at The Spectator, um, it wouldn't have been making a living. It would have been making a living for me because I'm I'm pretty, like, I can kind of cut away a lot of luxuries. Like, I don't, I don't really buy new clothes, I, you know. But I think it would have been very difficult. Like, maybe I would have made, like, 10 grand in the whole year. So, like it's you know that's not that's not enough money to live on really um yeah but uh, so yeah I mean it's a really terrible situation for freelance writers it, it, you know it goes without saying I'm sure you've encountered this before but um I think it's um it's a really tough climate and whenever people say they're going freelance like it's it's definitely like I, I kind of want to say like okay yes yeah, great but it's it's tough <laughs> Message from our sponsor, Vitsu. Marta's story. If only each shelf could talk, reflected Marta, a Vitsu customer since 2004. Her shelving system began modestly and has grown over the years. It travelled with her from London to Valencia and now Amsterdam. This is the fifth time Marta has bought from Vitsu. Every time she speaks with her personal Vitsu planner, Robin, who reorganised her bookshelves to fit her Spanish walls and her Dutch hoose. He even sent her extra packaging to protect her shelves with each move. You might say that their relationship has become a friendship over the years. Marta knows she is valued and trusts the advice Robin gives. If your shelves could talk, what would they say? Vitsu's 606 Universal Shelving System is a modular, adaptable kit of parts. It can form the perfect home for your books and even the desk from which to write one. Visit vitsu.com, V-I-T-S-O-E.com or request a free brochure via email at vitsu.com by quoting ATN 606. Vitsu, makers of long living furniture by Dieter Rams. Could we move on to your um, novel writing? Uh, You won an award for unpublished novels. What role did that play in getting an agent and then looking looking for Eliza. Uh, yeah, uh, so I, I wrote this like novella, I suppose, called An, an Unmaimed Man, which um, quite like, I think, an embarrassingly sort of grandiose title. Um, maybe when I was about 23, something like that, um, 22, 23. And um, I entered it into this um, now extinct writing competition. Um, and the prize was a thousand pounds and an agent. Um, and, I, and I won the, the um, award got the thousand pounds and spent it on a flight for me and my friend to India. So the money didn't last long. It lasted maybe like an hour. Um, (laughs) And then, then, uh, yeah. And then my agent, Laura McDougall, um, she was working at a different agency, but then she moved over to United and she's been really at the kind of heart of my, my success as a, as a, you know, limited though it is as a writer. Um, she, we, so it was funny, like when I won that prize, I, I've never, I've re- rarely felt more elation because I just felt like I, I'd made it. Like I was like, oh, I'm on my way to becoming a published novelist. Wow. You know, I was so excited. And then we flogged, we tried to sell the book to like maybe like six publishers or maybe, maybe it was, maybe it was fewer, maybe like four or five, any of the big ones. And they were, they were all like, no, no, no. <laughs> And and Orion um was kind of nice about it. They were like, We really like Lee's writing, but um, you know, we we just think this novel is it's it was very kind of like it was trying to be quite edgy. Like it was set over twenty well, set over twelve hours and it was about a man, a very cut off man. It was kind of Larkinian in its in its attempts, you know. It was it was about this this man who wakes up in like Woking and decides to go to London and, and kind of meanders around the city, eventually kind of meets his his kind of estranged family. 
Um, and the only scene of worth, I think, is is the kind of re when he's reunited with his with his wife um, in London on Clapham Road. And so Orion said, um, you know, we like Lee's writing, but can you give this a bit more more plot and structure? So then there was this kind of quite tortuous like few months where I was trying to like basically syringe in, you know, plot and drive and um and eventually the whole thing collapsed um and they said well it's not going to work but like do, does leaf have another idea and i did have another idea which was the idea for looking for eliza which they then um you know i wrote the the kind of the first few sort of first chunk maybe five thousand words and the synopsis um and then they bought it off that so it was it was uh the, the book the kind of manuscript prize was absolutely essential to me getting my first like or maybe my only book who knows but my first book published um but it it was a it was a long journey from me like getting that and like and I was certainly schooled and being so enthusiastic and like <laughs> happy about the prize because it wasn't it wasn't the end of the road <laughs> our um other perennial question with fiction writers is is how they approach their craft and whether you're a, a plotter or a plunger so whether you're one of these people who has the entire shape of the format of the novel up on the wall and post-it notes before you get going or whether you, you just dive in and we've you know completely huge variant range of response we've had but where do you fit on that spectrum I think I'm I'm a, a very sloppy plotter and then I dive in pretty quickly I, I think if if with Eliza I was frustrated at having to do the plot in such detail I think I was superstitious I had this feeling that um, that it, I would be sitting on top of my creativity by like you know planning it out. I wanted to make a, to make a lot of room for um, you know serendipity or not serendipity. That's a terrible way of putting it, but like for the creativity to just kind of provide the font, you know. And and I didn't. And actually, what I've learned, I'm I'm right. I've just kind of finished writing a play, and what I've what I've learned is that a huge thing actually over the past year and a half is that for me, I think more plotting, it's worth it basically because if you create a, a strongest scaffold, you know those times where you're where you're dipping, your energies are kind of dissipating, and you you think what you've written is a pile of shit. Um, th there's there's something there's a there's a kind of rock to kind of grab you know you can keep on going in that way so um, I think that's part of my journey as a writer is that um, I'm going to be plotting more and more and more um, maybe not to the kind of crime novel lengths I know that some people have very elaborate plots that's not really my vibe um, but uh, yeah I'm, I'm somewhere in between but um, I want to become more of a plotter than a kind of plunger. How do you find the experience of writing novels versus producing journalism do you find one easier than the other uh yeah I think that um sort of journalism is it's it's much quicker you know you get your you get the kind of turnaround of like um writing to reaction or or kind of it being you know out in the world and sometimes things get zero reaction which is funny and you know fair um is, is obviously much shorter um I think novels I, I feel like I mean, it's ironic that I'm in journalism to sort of keep, like, keep the, you know, keep my bills paid. But um, I, I think not writing fiction or, like, just invention, really, um, it sort of seems like a deeper work for me. It feels more meaningful um, and harder. Um, and and I, I'm much, I question, you know, it's, it's less formulaic. I mean, I think that, you know, with, with interviews, for instance... There's a story, there's, there are the quotes. It's kind of, I mean, it's not, you know, there's definitely good interviews and bad interviewers and good pieces, bad pieces. But um, it, once you kind of get into the knack of it, I think it's slightly, um, yeah, you can kind of keep on doing it. Whereas I, I feel like the, the lands are shifting much more when, I, when I'm writing either prose or, you know, poetry or I don't write very much poetry, but occasionally I do. Or anything else like I think it's um, much more challenging and I'm much more on my own and ignorant about how I should be going forth and that's kind of an uh, yeah like an exciting process for me. What was it like bringing the novel out in the middle of the pandemic? I saw again you'd you'd written about that and your your Zoom launch and so forth. Um, did you, how, how did it go? Was there any decision as to whether because it came out right at the beginning right in March March 2020. Yeah, it came out actually uh, sorry, in like, um, it was originally slated to come out in March and then we, it was actually, um, it was scheduled to come out on the same day as Hilary Mantel's novel, um, her last. Okay. So um, so we, we moved it to, to May the 14th and that was still in the kind of teeth of, I mean, we were, the, there was the end in sight of the kind of the first, you know, terrible 2020 lockdown, but um, we were still in lockdown. And so um, 
uh, I think I had a process of like feeling um, really dis- no, disappointed that I wouldn't be able to have like a big party, you know, in a bookshop and like, and ha- kind of the, you know, the, the sort of stock images of like what, what releasing a book is like, we're all, um, all had to go, um, you know, the kind of wine in the shop and like going round and talking on like slightly crappy stages to three people, you know, at a book festival in like, you know, Flanderno or whatever, um, all that stuff had to, had to go. And, and, and I think that was a bit, um, disappointing. Um, I was also quite like, I was a bit scared about what, how the sales would be and, you know, because bookshops were not, were not open. So it felt like a lot was suddenly riding on like online heat and that um I don't have like a huge online presence like some the kind of novelists that that you know that are push, pushing books out so I was quite anxious about that um but you know I mean I I did manage to I think just about to sort of put my woes in perspective and to realize that like you know I was I feel incredibly lucky to have actually been published at all a lot of people want to write a book they don't end up writing it a lot of people want to be published and they don't get published and so um, I kept, I really did try to bully myself into seeing the po- kind of positive because I think it's genuinely, you know, like I was in a really fortunate position that they hadn't even cancelled the book. You know, some, I think publishers that have been squeezed during the pandemic will be making more cautious decisions um, over the next couple of years as a result of the the money they've lost. So um, that sucks because it means that books that might have been given a chance won't be given a chance. And I was lucky that I was given a chance by by Orion. A lot of the reviews mentioned the sort of optim- inherent optimism and sort of sunny nature of the book. Um, was that something you were aiming for, or do you think that's a condition of sort of the setting in which the book was released? I I, I think it was more um, uh, a condition of like my state of mind when I was writing it. Um, I, I look back on it and I think uh, I could never write something so kind of um, optimistic about like it's about the story is about two women who are profoundly isolated and. Um, find kind of solace in, in one another and um, while I think there's still something to be said and you know that does happen um, I'm I'm I've become I think less sunny in outlook since I wrote the book which was you know at least three years ago um, well three years ago about um, so I I mean I, I think to some extent it's, it's been framed as very optimistic it probably is but then there are some quite dark themes in the book that some people I found like some some readers have said oh it's so depressing like I can't like oh I can't believe that you know this is happening to you know especially my younger character who is in this uh, well it's kind of extricating herself from this um quite um yeah abusive you know mentally abusive relationship with with an ex-girlfriend so um I, I'm sometimes surprised by the emphasis on how positive it is but equally I can see but I, I can see myself that I couldn't write something as kind of optimistic I don't think now um, and something I found kind of difficult to take is this, yeah, is that like, and I think it's, it happens to women authors a bit more maybe is, is a feeling that like, you know, oh, it's like a happy, happy story, you know, and, and I'm like, well, well, maybe, but like, I'm not sure that's quite fair. <laughs> um, so yeah. Did you make a kind of deliberate decision to sort of hew away from autobiography with the the younger character and that you know she's from the north like she she has a background that I suppose the Italian there's the, obviously the, the Italian literature link um but with with the younger character to, to to kind of write someone who was quite different in background and experience to yourself and what were the kind of merits that I saw there was one reviewer who was sort of pushing back on that saying like you know in a, in a slightly slightly aggressive way what what do you feel about about yeah that. um i i think that that's something i've 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 thought about a lot so my 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 younger character eliza of the the title um she is 25 and she's cumbrian um she's from a kind of uh, fairly poor household like not enormously rich i mean middle class but like not like massively rich um and um so it, you know i mean i'm not rolling in cash but like my parents i come from a, like quite a privileged family and went to private school and you know went to Cambridge University you know I've had I've had a pretty sweet ride and so I think that I mean I didn't I didn't consciously set out to write you know someone like oh I want to have my my character to be from x place and I wrote about Cumbria because I know Cumbria pretty well um well not that well but I know it fairly well and I think I wanted to kind of make sure that the story was was rooted in somewhere that I could be from you know that I wouldn't be like entirely inventing um and I, I think what it was, it's funny, like, the, the character came to me as a sort of, 
in in parts but a, 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 I, I think there was a kinship of like spirit of like that she felt very isolated and then I built the character around her feeling of being isolated at Oxford University where she started studying for a PhD and so I tried to work out what you know I mean there are plenty of people who can feel alone in any situation whether they kind of technically have the kind of demographics to fit in or not um, but I, I, I saw her as a kind of yeah, uh, a Cumbrian, not necessarily, um, yeah, I, I feel like that the criticism that maybe um, I was overreaching in terms of trying to make her different from me is, it, it's a huge, it's a huge question because novelists have to invent and, um, I, I, you know, I've I've spoken to, you know, different people about like, how far you can go from your own kind of path. And I think you can go basically pretty far, but as long as you're doing it in a way that feels like sensitive and um true and maybe in the in the case of that reader perhaps like I didn't perhaps she didn't buy the kind of the the act of invention and that's you know a totally legitimate um criticism to make but I think but I do feel a bit uncomfortable with the idea that we have to you know police what novelists you know where how how far novelists can stray from their own experience because it's um it's a, it will narrow the field of kind of novels and and that's um a bit of a shame in my view. Could you tell us a little bit about your lockdown novel in installments um project? Why you decided to do that and um you know how you structured that because I noticed that you you invited people to give you suggestions for where the plot should go. Yeah, so I was I was writing this thing called the well I started writing. Um, a story called the birthday party um, during the first lockdown and um, it, I sort of structured it as a, as a newsletter format where every week I would send out 5,000 words thereabouts um, to the people who'd signed up um, for the novel and um, in between the installments in between the email being sent out every week I'd be writing um, about a thousand words a day um, with a bit of you know leverage for editing um, or leeway for e editing. Um, so I, I kind of, I want, I started on that project because I felt like I wasn't really doing enough w like creative work and that I needed to be, um, when I were looking for Eliza, I'd signed a contract. So I had to write the book for that. And I wanted to have a similar sort of social pressure to, to actually produce something. So, um, I sort of kicked myself into doing, into feeling that social pressure by, um, you know, persuading people to sign up and and you know quite a few did and so I had that every week this feeling that like people might notice if it didn't land in their inboxes at, like on like when Wednesday morning at like eight or whatever um so uh, it also felt like everything had kind of turned inside out with the with the pandemic um and that people were using the internet in a new way you know everyone was zooming cocktails and you know having like games nights and I mean it was pretty awful a lot of that but like I, it felt like there was there was a bit of a a moment of vulnerability in terms of like people were maybe slightly more up for trying things that they wouldn't usually have tried um so I I kind of gave it a go and um it was a really useful thing I'm not sure I don't vouch for the quality of the overall thing and and if I were to publish it properly I would I would edit you know the hell out of it but like it was so useful for kind of shedding light on um, you know, what, what is useful, what, you know, what can be done in, in, in tight periods of time, what is useful by which I mean, like, it's helpful to be able to seed bits of the story earlier, and to have more of a sense of where the story's going, you know, all sorts of things. Um, so it was, it was a really, uh, fun project for me, um, maybe not for my readers. <laughs> Could we talk about Tatler? Um, both about how you uh, kind of chose to take take that job and, you know, a bit just about the magazine as well, like where where you feel it kind of comes from historically and with its its tradition and where, where it is today. Yeah, um, so I started working at Tatler at the end of August as the um, acting features director, um, which basically is a fancy way of saying I kind of, I edit the features in the magazine. Um, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of, well, the, the job is, um, you know, just basically filling all those the, the acres of pages, which um, I've never had to fill as many pages in my life. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, all in uh, under the kind of leadership of Richard Denon, who's the editor. Um, it's an interesting magazine. It's been going for sort of hundreds of years um, and traditionally has been a kind of, the, you know, is the magazine and, and probably still is or intends to be of, of sort of, um, you know, high flying um, elites across the country. Um it's got, uh, it, it's, it, it does a lot of, um, well, it, it, it tries, it, in the sort of social media era, it's, its role has changed because 
um, maybe in you know early two thousands, the bystander pages were full, filled with um, party pictures of parties, um, which uh, and people would buy the magazine partly to see themselves in it because um, you know there was no so there was no Instagram, so actually you know places like um, Tatler were were quite kind of in- integral to um, a certain like social crusts like you know the way they they'd see themselves in the in the magazine was quite an interesting one so um and and that's changed it's become a lot more since the it, it went through a very sort of rambunctious phase under Kate Reardon a previous editor who um you know would like fit, some of her covers are hilarious and you know famously would write about like who's got the best tits and like you know best legs of you know Lincolnshire and you know really really up like funny pieces um and it's become um under under Richard Denon um more kind of chic and um I think, uh, you know, underpinning his editorial vision is a sort of a, a desire to make it more kind of old school vanity fair, um, but without losing sight of its like, you know, roots in, uh, you know, basically what what's what's happening, like what are people what are people up to and who who matters. Um, so it's an interesting place for me to work. And it's not somewhere that I could ever have seen myself working because I'm not really plugged into who's who and um I don't I don't feel like I've got the the friends that the kind of you know upper upper class friends that maybe um might be expected of someone who works at Tatler but that here I am doing the job (laughs) I read in a trade sort of online article about Tatler um when when the new editor came on board in 2018 that the readership is between age nine and 99 and I wondered whether that was true and if so how on earth you commission content that would fit all of those age groups <laughs> yeah it is it is really it's um it's very varied um you're right and uh, I don't I don't know if um I haven't looked at the readership figures l- lately but I I do think that that doesn't surprise me at all like I wouldn't be surprised if, it, if, it, if they were as young as nine um we do try and well one one way in which I've sometimes had to take out swear words because you know it's a deemed a family magazine so I so don't want to make it too kind of potty mouthed although a bit of swearing is fine um, so that that's one way in which that kind of diverse readership kind of comes into play. Um, what I, I'm really interested by how like it'll be read by like people like, you know, uh, women in Essex who aren't rich necessarily, but who, you know, kind of buy into the fantasy of it. And also kind of like, you know, hunting mothers in like Norfolk, you know, who who really know everyone in it. And so there's the, I, I, I quite like that about it, that it's that it's speaking to really different people at the same time. And it makes um well, you know, commissioning for Tatler during the pandemic has been a challenge because it's really about, you know, the new trends and who's seeing who and what's, you know, like what's happening in, in society. And society has be- has become so, you know, kind of interior and home based um, that it's uh, it's it's quite like how do you how do you bring that kind of energy into the into a magazine when actually outside the streets are pretty empty and um, no one's going out um, to those parties that used to give Tatler that kind of life. Um, so that's been a, a major challenge. I have two questions, actually. How long are you going to be there? How long is your engagement with it for? And then how much of the, the features in particular are written in-house and how much is, is from external freelancers? Um, so I'm going to be there. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not sure um, with, with maternity covers. You don't. It's a maternity cover and I'm covering for um, a, a woman called Claire Conway, who's the, the brilliant features director. You, you don't. Uh, I think I'm, I'm on contract to stay for a year, so she might want to come back sooner. She might not. Um, so we'll see. Um, and then and I'm also doing the film reviews, which is um, like a, a really fun aspect, which um, Tatler didn't do film or used to do film reviews, but hasn't done them um, until fairly recently when I started writing them, which has been fun. Um, and in terms of like freelance versus staff, we do quite a lot of the kind of smaller features um, in house. So the kind of like bitty, like front of book, as we call them, little um, social pages. So we did a, a piece on, you know, parks and who goes to what park, for instance, um, that will be done in house because it's really hard to farm that out to a freelancer who doesn't know t- the Tatler world well, whereas we have people in-house who really do know who goes to what, which parks and things. But then we, you know, a lot of the other big pieces that we do, we, we try and, you know, we give we give to freelancers. So I'd say, um, you know, at least half, if not more than half, is written by freelancers. Um, a lot of them we have a relationship with. So, you know, Joseph Bullmore is a writer that we're using a lot at the moment. Mark Edmonds we use. Um, you know, other writers I'm going to try and bring on more. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always interested in, in, in having new writers write for us um, and, and hopefully, um, you know, increasingly as we get out of the pandemic and we can, you know, send people off to do things that are fun. 
It might be a difficult question given I'm sure your experience of working at Tatler has been mostly remote, but I wondered whether you could tell us a bit about the sort of workplace culture. I'm thinking of A.A. A. Gill's depiction of, of working there in the 1990s, um, the sort of loud conversations about sex in the office. Um, you know, what, what your experience of working at Tatler has been like and, and how important things like social class are. Yeah, um, I I think that it's been it's been weird because I've spent you know I was onboarded as they say um, in the summer when um, you know we we were coming into the office but I've I've only ever really come into the office maybe like two days a week maximum so it's been quite remote but um, uh, it feels like when when we get back into things I think it'll be a really hilarious place to work because um, some of the features that we that we have to turn around are quite like you know even if that we've lost the, that Kate Reardon kind of rambunctiousness. Um, it is still there is still room for kind of funny things and you'd have conversations that like um you know won't won't necessarily be heard in in most like you know <laughs> editorial offices <laughs> across the land um i don't i mean i think a cl- the class is a really it's a really yeah difficult question to like unpack but um it seems that like i mean we we'll, i'm i really want us to expand basically what what it means to be a sort of tatler person and traditionally that has meant often like quite like a white upper middle class um sort of landowner um but i think that um we're you know we're moving with the times and and i i want to kind of because you know tatler sets who tatler people are, it like are um and i and i hope that we can continue to kind of make room for more more people in that kind of category as it were we're coming up against our time limit, but again, um, in the spirit of always asking about money on the podcast, can you give an indication of what you pay people who write for Tatler? Yeah, um, so we pay 40p a word. Um, occasionally, um, so yeah, occasionally we'll, we'll go higher um, if it's in need of a, you know, really excellent kind of story that we couldn't get another way. Um, but yeah, 40p a word is, is our basic rate. And I guess as a sort of final question, could you tell us a little bit about your next projects? You mentioned uh, writing a play. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm working on a play uh, partly with Bill Browder, who is um, an American former kind of investment manager um, who went off to Russia and made a fortune. And then um, one of his uh, kind of the people who worked for him, um, Sergei Magnitsky, um, was under his employ and then eventually got imprisoned and killed in a Russian prison. Um, so and, and Bill Browder, since that happened, has kind of reinvented himself as a human rights campaigner. So I'm writing a play about um, about the Magnitsky Act, which is this act that came into being after the death of Sergei Magnitsky. Um, that's kind of that tries to clip the wings of um, dictators across the world. Um, so that's my my current project. Uh, and then but I, I sort of finished writing that play. So it's kind of in the post post sort of writing stage where I'm talking about contracts and things. Um, and then, and, you know, hopefully it'll get put on, but maybe it won't, you know, I'm, I'm well used to having writing, big writing projects that then come, you know, come to nothing. Um, and then hopefully I'll be doing my next novel. So I'm, I'm right now reading loads just in order to get back into the zone of, I was reading loads of plays. Now I'm reading loads of novels because I'm, I want to write a novel again. Brilliant. Well, Leif, look, thank you for being a fantastic guest and always take notes and telling us about all your hugely varied projects and wishing you all the best with everything going forward. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Hello, it's us again. That was an Always Take Notes interview with Leif Arbuthnot. Her novel, Looking for Eliza, is published by Orion Books, and you can find her on Twitter at Leif Arbuthnot. Rachel, how have you been? I've been good, other than a slight hiccup, which has delayed this recording with some grit in my eye. Um... (laughs) Yeah, you've had a a, a medical emergency. Well, yeah. Um, But in terms of other things, fine, yeah. Um, How about you? Could you, t- could you tell the listeners about your medical emergency? I mean, it's, that's about it. I mean, I got something in my eye in a run. And then um, luckily my dad is an ophthalmologist. So I uh, got to have my eyelid turned inside out and looked, you know, examined. So that's always fun on a Monday. On a Monday evening. Well, very, <laughs> glad, very glad you're okay and still in one piece. Um, apart from that, what's been going on? Um, much the same. Doing lots of interviews for the profile I mentioned last time. And um, yeah sort of business as usual how about you um i'm failing to take a holiday which i think is a sort of a perennial freelancer point and i had planned to take this week off um because i was pretty exhausted after my book stuff um and was trying to get that sort of sorted by the last week and then some other work stuff came up which is great but has meant that i More had book to stuff. no well yeah just 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 kind of work things that i needed to turn around this week so i am determined that i'm gonna take next week off now um but it is something we've discussed in the show about like how kind of 
tricky it is to say no to things and, and stuff like that. So I'm feeling I'm feeling slightly sluggish, I would say. Um, but hopefully I'll, I, my vigour will be renewed next week. Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our graphics are by James Edgar, and our score is by Jess Danheiser. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes, on Twitter at Take Notes Always. If you'd like to support us via our crowdfunding page, you can find that on Patreon at Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.